now on to the probably the most important topic in physics IB1 and IB2. Now, this, these are concepts that you should know because it applies to every single topic in physics in some way, shape, or form. We not, may not always use this uh, directly, but some sort of indirect relationship. So the idea of conservation of energy and power, this is actually the uh, first law of thermodynamics, saying that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it simply changes from one form to the next. So in IP1, we focused on a couple of different types of energy. We're going to add to this list in IP2. We're going to review these for sure, but we're going to add to this list. There's lots of different types of energy. Sound, light, heat, things like that. Uh, we're going to, but we did talk about these in IB1. So let's go over what they are and then how to write conservation of energy equations because those are so useful to figure out physics problems. So the first type of energy we'll talk about is kinetic energy. And the way you know that an object has kinetic energy is if it's moving. Anything that's moving has kinetic energy. So if it's moving, it has kinetic energy. Boom, right, for sure. Then uh, the equation for kinetic energy, it's written as k, is equal to one half mass times velocity squared. So what I would do for sure by the, at least by the end of the year, is to make this table and memorize it. Memorize all the different types of energy and what all their equations are and know how to write conservation of energy equations. This can be so useful throughout the year, uh, especially as we review. Now work. Work and energy are kind of the same thing. Work is uh, what results because of energy. So but we're gonna just treat it like a type of energy. Work is anything that's being pushed or pulled. So if there's any pushing, or pulling on the object, then work is done. There's energy being put into that um, object because it's being pushed or pulled physically. And the equation for work is force F times displacement, S. So if it physically moves with a force, there's work done on it. Next one we talked about was gravitational potential energy, which is if there's any sort of height to the object, the object wants to fall down, um, so if there's any sort of height away from the, the Earth or another planet, for example, it wants to fall. And that energy is stored in terms of gravity. It wants to get back to the center of the Earth. Uh, so the equation for that, EP, is equal to M times G times H, where M is mass, G is gravitational acceleration, and H is the height that you raise it up. Elastic potential energy, this deals with springs and bungee cords. If you want to stretch something, it wants to spring back. So if there's say springs, right? energy stored in springs. So a lot of times uh, it was ES, energy of a spring, is equal to one half K, which is the elastic constant, how st strong the spring is, times X squared, X is the distance from equilibrium. There's electrical energy. If there's, if there's electricity, electrons being used. Uh, there's actually lots of different equations for electrical energy, um, but you just think electricity. And uh, probably the most useful one, electrical energy, E is equal to voltage times current times time. So if you know the voltage that it uses and the current that it uses, multiply that by the amount of time that you use it for, you can get your electrical energy. Right? Dissipated energy, this is like energy that's dissipated to the environment. The second law of thermodynamics says that when you change one form of energy to the next form of energy, you always lose some, and you can't get it back. It goes to the environment, you can't get it back. It goes in the form of heat, or de deforming the object, whatever. That's all called dissip dissipated energy. And the way you can calculate that, really it's just work done by friction. Another way, for, another word for dissipated energy is the work that friction does in the object. So it's gonna have, um, it's gonna do with friction, it's gonna have dissipated energy, and it uses the exact same equation as this one. Dissipated energy, or work, is equal to the frictional force this time times the displacement, right, or the distance in this case. So dissipated energy can work both directions. And then one that we didn't really cover in depth, uh, we will focus a little bit on it, um, is rotational energy. Uh, this is anything that's rotating. Now, like I said, out of all these, this is the one that we're going to spend the least amount of time on. But it, it, it does come up, especially if you're going to go into engineering. Uh, but this is like anything that's spinning or rotating has some sort of rotational energy, uh, we're going to ignore that probably for most of this class. 
but the equation for it, um, E wrote is equal to some sort of constant, shape constant, one half times the shape constant times mv squared. Uh, like I said, we're going to probably ignore that for most of the year, but it does come up, uh, especially like a ball or a or something. So like I said, there are some other energies we're going to add to that, like light energy, ionization energy, thermal energy. We're going to add some more into this list, but we're going to start with these. Now, the next thing you have to do and be very confident with is to write conservation of energy equations. And we're going to run into a lot of weird scenarios. Let's go through an example. Let's say we had a block here, and we press this block across the spring, and so we compress the spring, and then we build up that stored energy, and then we release it, and that block then goes up this ramp, and um, ends on top of the ramp. And there's friction throughout the whole process. So we're gonna write a conservation of energy equation. And the way you do that is you, you think about what energy or energies do you start with? What energies do you end up with? And you just set them equal to each other. They want all the energies that you have to start with, all the energies that you have to end up with, and you just set them equal to each other. Just do that. And what we're gonna do is look at this list and go one by one. So. We're compressing the spring, and we're going to start our timer the moment we let the spring go. So, is it moving when it starts? If we compress it and we hold it there and let it go, is it moving? No. We could give it a push along the way, and then we can either add in kinetic or work, but we're not going to. We're just going to compress that spring, hold it there, and let it go. So, initially, before it starts, there is no kinetic and there's no work. That's it, that was already taken care of before the process started. Does that make sense? So the moment you start your timer, it's compressed, start your timer to go, and the only, well, those two are not in there. Is there gravitational potential? Not really, because it's on ground level. It's on the ground level. We're gonna call that zero energy in the ground level. So there's no gravitational potential. Is there elastic potential? Is there a spring involved? Yes, there's a spring involved. So we're gonna write down one half kx squared, because there's elastic potential energy. We're gonna write that down. Is there dissipated energy? Not yet. Not yet. It doesn't use dissipated energy until the end. Is there electrical energy? That's a good one. No. Unless you use some sort of like electrical uh, motor or something to do it, the process, or get, the motor gives it a push, but no. Uh, there's no electrical energy. Is it rotational? No. If there was a, if it was a ball or something, then we could add rotation in later. But there's no. It's, no, it's not going to rotate. Okay? So this is it. This is the only starting energy we, we have. Hopefully that makes sense. But I went through all the energies that we know of and thought about, does it have each one? Yes or no? And the only one that had that was relevant was elastic. We're going to set that equal to the energies at the end. So instantly what has to happen is this box is going to shovel up this ramp and it's going to have energy. It's going to require energy to get there or it's going to use up energy along the way. So let's think about that. What energies does it have to use along the way to get there? Well. Let's go uh, with the obvious ones. It has to raise up. It has to increase its height. So the energy that is going to increase height is gravitational potential. For sure, it has to use gravitational potential, so MGH. Is there other types of energy involved? Well, I said there was friction. I said there was friction, so since there's friction, it's going to dissipate some energy along the way. So I'm going to add that on. I'm going to write down force of friction times distance for displacement. Add that along the way. Is it going to rotate? Probably not. Is there electrical energy involved? Not this time. Is there elastic potential? No, use that up. It's gone. Once, once the spring's released, there's no more electrical energy. It's gone. Is there work involved? Well, the work was already done before the spring was compressed. Is it kinetic energy? If the block is still moving at the top, then yes. So what you could do is write the F uh, plus one half energy squared if the block is still moving. Now, if the block's not moving, then this velocity would just end up being zero when you calculate it. So then we would just need some numbers. We would need to know what the elastic constant is, or you know what the different the, uh, frictional force is, uh, the height of this ramp is. We can figure out all sorts of things, like how high up the block, up the ramp does it go? What's the coefficient of friction on the ramp to make it not stop? How fast is it moving once it gets to the top? Et cetera, et cetera. What's the elastic constant on the spring need to be? How far do you need to compress the spring? Depending on what information we know, well, what variables we know, we would just plug in the missing information. Let's do another example. Back in IV1, you guys rode a mechanical bike. You rode a bike, and it lit up light bulbs. 
So let's try to think about what sort of energy is involved there. Well, with that one, you put work into the bike. So it kind of depends on what you know. So our starting energy depends on what you know. Maybe you know the amount of kinetic energy that you put in. Maybe you know how fast the bike was moving. Maybe you know the amount of force and displacement you left. Maybe you know the rotational speed of the tires. But you don't have to put all three of them in. It de depends on which one you know. Do you know the force? Do you know the velocity? Or do you know the rotational speed? Depending on which one you know, that's the one you start with. Let's say that you knew the mass of the bike and the velocity of the bike, which one you use? Well, this deals with the mass of the tire and the velocity of the tire and the shape of the mass of the tire. This one deals with force and displacement, how far you went and how much force you put in. This one deals with mass and velocity. Right? Once again, we're gonna probably ignore this one for now, so we're not gonna use that a whole lot, so you can probably ignore it. Just know that it exists. But kinetic energy is the one we use. So we start with the kinetic energy, based on what we know. That's our starting energy. And then think about what we end up getting. Well, it lights light bulbs. It's lighting light bulbs, so what kind of energy is that gonna be? Well, light bulbs use electrical energy. They light up because of electricity. But the voltage big B times current I times T. Right? And then there's always gonna be some sort of dissipated energy. That's the second law term in NX, meaning that any sort of transformation, you're always gonna lose some energy. So we're gonna always put uh, frictional force times distance or displacement uh, in there. Now sometimes you can ignore it, sometimes it'll say like yeah, it's 100% efficient, or the frictional force is negligible. Then you can ignore that. But in most cases you have to put it in there. Now you can also do these same conservation of uh, energy equations with conservation of power. And power is just energy divided by time. So if you want to figure out power, you can just do one half energy squared divided by t, or force times displacement divided by t, or mgh divided by t, or one half kx squared divided by t for time. This one just ends up being power equals i times v, v, right? Same thing, force times displacement divided by time, or um, one half cmv squared divided by time. So if you want to do the same relationships to power, let's say you put 50 watts of power of uh, kinetic, kinetic energy power. Power, mechanical power, some such as called. You get electrical power out, you can set those equal to each other as well. But we're going to focus on energy because it's often called conservation of energy, law conservation of energy. Hopefully that makes sense.